Hello everyone, this is Misut. I'm very happy to be here and to be a part of this amazing conference and I'm very excited to share my experiences about some monitoring activities and some metrics to monitor in terms of the quality maturity or the maturity of our quality teams uh, and we will talk about lots of details. But first of all, what I can say is I have worked in lots of different domains like uh, defense industry, the industrial automation, IoT and robotics, but uh, what I can say is, whatever we are doing, we are generating some data and uh, there are lots of metrics to continuously track, to get some information about our progress and our maturity. Even if without uh, the job that we are doing, even if without what we are doing in our companies, even when we are sitting at our homes while watching TV or doing something in our smartphones, we are continuously generating data. Because while uh, sometimes I'm doing something in my smartphone, I'm getting some notifications like the screen time was higher than uh, one hour higher than the last time, the last week. So which means we are continuously generating data. Raw data is always over there. But this raw data may be somehow converted to some valuable information. So data can be put into valuable information. And by these terms, we can collect some ideas and get some insights about what we are doing, about, about our activities. Because, yeah, we are doing something, we are making some progress, and we are completing some tasks. But to analyze this, to interpret this, what we are doing, or in what pace we are doing this, we can track this information, track this data, and uh, by interpreting them, we can convert this data, raw data, into valuable information. There are lots of different uh, data that we can uh, track and combine and then uh, do some calculations and eventually we can reach to some uh, valuable information to get some ideas about uh, our decision making activities as well in these terms we can see how uh, much progress we have made until that time and then in the same pace what uh, what else we can do more in the future so if at that time if we realize that we need something more or we have to stop doing something then we can decide these kind of uh, action items. So we will discuss lots of details. And here is the brief agenda about the talk. We will start by, uh, first of all, discussing why this is important, what kind of advantages we can get uh, from these monitoring activities and why it is uh, essential for the quality or seeing the maturity of the quality. What else we can do? Uh, what other activities we can add into our workflows or our life cycle, our processes? And then we will discuss the optimization of the metrics that we track and then uh, customization of the environments because we may customize our environments to make our workflows and our life cycle as transparent and as visible as possible. And in this way, by uh, adding some custom fields into our processes, into our transitions, we will be able to see all the transitions, all the state transitions uh, on our tasks and on our progress. We will be uh, making our environments as visible as possible. And then we will discuss lots of different metrics uh, and different categories of metrics, what kind of metrics we can track to decide about the maturity of our quality. And then finally, at the end of the presentation, I will share you a small little uh, practical application in which I automatically continuously track our uh, quality metrics. So let's start with the first part. The first of all, why we are doing this? Why is it essential? Because uh, what advantages we can get uh, of these monitoring activities? Or by trying to analyze the maturity of quality, what can we do? by these terms. First of all, we can see our, uh, or we can evaluate our current situation. If we are good enough to proceed to the next steps, or if we should uh, change something, we can decide this. First of all, we can see our current progress. For example, how much, uh, what percentage of the task we have completed so far, or uh, the covered portion of the requirements by the test cases, we can see this. Uh, maybe half of the requirements are covered by the test cases and still the second half are waiting to be covered by the test cases. We should define more test cases, or we can see the finished number of uh, executions, or uh, how many bugs do we have, or how many uh, critical bugs do we have, how many low priority bugs do we have. We can see all these kind of uh, numbers and all this kind of uh, progress and all the situation we are in. We can uh, observe and track with, this, uh, with the help of these metrics. And on the other hand, after seeing our current situation and our progress, then we can make a feature estimation with a linear projection. Because for example, in the sprint, in the middle of the sprint, if I monitor our, my progress, and if I see that I could not finish maybe even one third of the task in my backlog, then for the second week, for the second half, I can decide that if I continue with the same pace, then I, maybe I can uh, finish another one third so it means eventually it will be maybe two thirds of the whole uh, task in the sprint backlog. So it is not sufficient. Normally, uh, after my planning, 
I was supposed to complete all the tasks in my sprint planning. So after doing this, I can take some action items. Maybe uh, after I see that, I already see that I will not be able to complete all of them. Maybe I will continue with uh, the high priority ones. Actually, uh, I would already do that. I should already have done it. But somehow, if I was not able to complete my uh, actual tasks and I had some other tasks, then maybe I can uh, continue to concentrate on the uh, most essential task in my sprint. I can do this kind of uh, decisions and uh, take some action items if I need. The thing is, first of all, see the current progress and then with the same speed or with the uh, same conditions, under the same conditions, how much more I can do. I can do this feature projection. It will help me to take some action items. In this way, I can uh, answer lots of questions like uh, about uh, regarding the number of the bugs in the product or the uh, different aspects of test cases, how mature my test cases are or uh, what kind of test cases I have or on the functional or some non-functional test cases as well or about the requirements or about the maybe the uh, use cases or uh, re regarding the time issues, like how much time I am spending on different types of uh, tasks or how much time I need to complete some different tasks, I will be able to answer lots of different questions. Because otherwise, if I don't have some numbers, or if I don't have some facts, then the, the things that I claim are just only some sayings without some evidence. I will say that uh, whenever the project managers ask me that, how much time do you need to complete your test cases? Then I can say one week, two week. But based on what I am saying this, if I do these monitoring activities, then this will be an evidence for me. In the past cycle, for this number of test cases, it took this much time to complete all the execution. So this time, for the next upcoming uh, cycle, for this number of test cases, I need this time. I can do this uh, regarding the previous monitoring activities. It will be as an evidence for me. And as I told, of course, we will get some insights. Collecting lots of different information help us to uh, see the weaknesses in our processes. For example, I can see, okay, I have 10 bugs, 10 major bugs, all in the uh, performance type. Then I can conclude that maybe in the next sprint, I can more concentrate on the performance issues or performance test cases. So this kind of weaknesses or the points to improve can be revealed by this uh, kind of uh, tracking the metrics and the uh, different uh, monitoring activities. So let's uh, see and uh, discuss what we can do to perform these monitoring activities in the best way. Okay, monitoring activities is very essential and helps a lot, and we can get lots of different advantages. We can see our uh, progress and our current situation, and we can do a feature estimation as well. But in what way we can do it in the best way? One of the best practices is, the first one maybe, is to uh, conclude on which metrics we have to cover or we uh, would uh, like to cover, because there are dozens of metrics that we can track. There are hundreds of thousands of metrics that we can track, but uh, going on with all of them is not possible. Covering uh, all uh, every individual uh, single metric is not possible. So what we can do is decide to a subset which can serve to our goals in the best way, then continue with this subset. Optimize the metrics and decide which one is the best, which one is the most suitable for me, serving to my goals. For example, if my goal is to reduce the average test execution duration, then maybe what, what metrics I should concentrate on are the ones which are somehow related to the execution duration, directly or indirectly. First of all, I can track the individual average execution duration for each test case. I can calculate this and uh, continue to track if it is going high or if it is reducing in time, because my goal is to reduce the average execution duration for each test case. So I can directly uh, track this. But I can track some other metrics which can participate into this execution duration. But of course, I have to decide which one are the relevant ones. Because if I concentrate on some irrelevant metrics, then I will lose some time. So the first thing is to decide for the best subset to continue to track. Because otherwise, it is not easy. It is maybe impossible to track all of them. And I will lose a lot of time. But how can I decide which subset is the best one? I can have uh, some checklists like the correlation of the different metrics, uh, matrices that I uh, continue to track or the consistency of each metric. They are reliable or they are predictable in time or they have discriminative power or not. We, uh, I can take these parameters as my uh, decision uh, factors and then I can decide uh, to my uh, subset in the best way. Uh, maybe a second best practice is the customization of the environments. Because whatever tool or platform I'm using, 
then it is representing my progress. For example, for the issue tracking system, if I'm using Jira, then uh, there are some ways to customize the workflows, customize the state transitions. For example, the, for example, the default workflow is starting from the open status or new status and then in progress and then done. But for me, it was not sufficient. So what we have done in our project is to add lots of different custom fields. Like for example, for our uh, we de designed a life cycle, a custom life cycle for our test case uh, test cases, and then we added all the relevant fields over there. Like after a uh, test case is created, after it is in new status, then it goes into in design because first of all the test steps are designed, and then after the design is finished, it is reviewed by another colleague, who maybe who will uh, execute the test case. So we set it under uh, review status. And then if it is decided that, okay, it is executable, either manual or uh, with uh, the help of automated scripts, then we set it into executable state. And then if it is uh, possible to automate the test code, we start the implementation uh, tasks. And then finally, the code implementation, uh, the developed code is done. It is also reviewed. And finally, we set the test case uh, to a uh, finalized state. So in this way, I can see all the transitions and in each step, for example, whenever it was designing, it was being designed, I can see how much time was consumed at that stage. And then, because on Jira, I can track that at what time it was set to in design, at uh, and at what, what time it was set to designed. So subtracting this time from each other, then I can uh, measure the time in between these two state transition points. And I can understand that how much time I need to design a test case in average. Uh, and we added some other custom fields for tracking, and uh, in this way we can uh, we were able to get lots of different insights about, uh, for example, the branches uh, before being uh, merged. How much time was consumed for each branch when the PR was created and when it was merged, or uh, about the execution duration for each test case we were adding. In this execution, it was like ten seconds, and each time in after each execution, I was setting this uh, value. 10 seconds or 15 seconds, whatever. And eventually I was being, uh, I was able to measure or calculate the average duration. I will show you how we can do this uh, in an automated manner because after each execution, setting the execution duration for each single test case is almost impossible. It is very difficult. After these best practices, let's see what kind of the categories of metrics we may have in our monitoring activities. First of all, the time related metrics because time is precious and very important and one of the pillars of the project management. Most of the time we are trying to schedule our activities and by what time we can start or by what time we can finish. So mainly how much time do we need to perform some specific tasks we are trying to decide and we are trying to uh, schedule them in the best way because otherwise we may be late and we may be behind of the schedule. So we may have to pay some penalties due to the delays. So that's not a desired situation. So we are trying to schedule in the best way. So maybe the way to do that is to continuously track the metrics and according to the lessons learned, like how much time we consumed in the past cycles for the uh, execution of the full test set, or what was the time in between two different activities, if we calculate them or uh, measure them in our past samples and past experiences, then uh, we may be deciding them uh, for the next cycles in a very healthy and consistent way. Another category of the metrics is the cost related metrics because another pillar of the project management is cost. Because money matters, everyone is trying to minimize or reduce the costs. So we are continuously tracking how much resources we consume or how much uh, cost or budget we are consuming for training activities or uh, we are calculating the headcounts, uh, all the costs related, including the human. Uh, costs or the tools, platforms, or the uh, activities in the technical manners that we perform. So we are trying everything to reduce uh, in terms of the cost. So in this way, uh, we can do what we can do is to uh, calculate or track all the costs and see if some unneeded budget is consumed on some specific activities. Then maybe we can get rid of them if it is not really needed in terms of the quality of the project or the product. So to do that, we may be uh, observing all the costs and deciding if uh, they are really needed or serving to the ultimate goal of the project or not. If it is something that is not really serving to the ultimate goal, which is the quality or the satisfaction of the customers, then maybe we can maybe postpone it or totally cancel it. We may take some action items regarding it. And eventually, the 
third or maybe the uh, and maybe the most important pillar of the project management is the quality pillar because yeah we are trying to reduce the time needed to complete our uh, fulfill our activities and we are trying to reduce the cost to fulfill our activities yeah we minimize them but what about quality yeah we minimize the time we minimize the cost but we don't have quality so it doesn't mean anything it doesn't make a lot of sense so eventually we need some quality right because otherwise the customers will not be satisfied with our products they will not be using it so it doesn't make sense to reduce the cost or the time if we don't have any quality so how we can measure the quality it is not easy but still we may track some uh, metrics and decide at least how mature our quality processes are so one of the maybe the most essential one is uh, some metrics collected over bugs because bugs are representing some uh, aspects of the product or the project because it is showing uh, some different aspects like the functional or the non-functional aspects or not, not only the product but the process as well how good we are performing our testing activities or the quality related related activities like we can uh, show or monitor the distribution of bugs among their priority or severity levels how much impact those issues have for example if we find some issues we have a great impact which may even result in the uh, loss of some uh, customers then it means that we have some really major issues so in this way we can understand uh, the quality or the level of the quality of the product or we may uh, monitor the distribution of bugs among the component of the system on which they heap together on for example most of the bugs if most of the bugs heap together on a specific component then we can uh, understand that we have a quality issue on that specific component or unit or subsystem whatever it is so then we may take some action items to improve the quality on that specific part of the system or maybe we can uh, monitor the distribution of bugs according to their ages for example how old these bugs are for how long they are open still not resolved so in this way again we can understand that uh, how old bugs we have in our system or in what pace we are resolving them how capable we are to immediately resolve those issues in the system we can get lots of insights analyzing the bugs there are lots of valuable information underlying the bugs we may somehow reveal them and convert these raw data into real valuable information and in this way we can collect lots of insights both in terms of the product and our processes as well so we can improve them but uh, specifically on bugs what we can track is maybe the number of escape bugs because escape bugs are the bugs which were not found in the development activities or the testing activities but were found and reported by the customers from the real production environments so we may concentrate on this because why if they were not found in the early stages if they were found in the later stages it means that the fix would be much more difficult because the code is already in the production environment changing the design would be really difficult and much costly whenever the bugs are found by the customers in the real environment they will uh, they will get in contact with the uh, business team or operations team to uh, take some support and they will talk to development teams or the uh, leader of the development team and the uh, team leader will uh, distribute uh, the tasks among the team so it will require a lot of time we will lose a lot of time and this cycle will result in some extra costs so of course the ideal uh, solution is to find the issues or weaknesses or vulnerabilities of the product in the development activities before releasing it into production environment so we may concentrate on a number of escape bugs and try to understand the root causes why we are having some escape bugs normally we were already supposed to cover all the use scenarios and find the weaknesses but if we have somehow escape bugs then we may try to understand why our test cases do not fully cover the use cases we may go over these kind of issues and uh, try to minimize uh, the number of escape bugs in the later cycles and eventually we have some inner quality aspects as well i name this this uh, as inner quality because normally they are not seen by the uh, end users for example we have a code complexity issue in the product maybe end user is not aware of this and maybe it is still maybe even it is okay to have this code complexity because in terms of the usage of the end user whatever algorithm you are using is not really 
important. You may use anything if you somehow succeed to uh, develop the behavior. But of course, uh, considering the maintainability or the long-term quality, it is really important. It is of great significance in terms of the uh, recoverability or maintainability. Because if the code is not understandable or it is not uh, meeting the standards of the quality and uh, the uh, other best practices for developing the code, then it means that uh, to fix the issues in the later stages will be much more difficult because the code is not understandable. And whenever we have some issues, it will not be easy to understand to uh, change the algorithm or apply the fix. So in these terms, even though the end users are not aware of these kind of issues, it may still uh, have some impact on our uh, quality processes. And finally, in addition to all these uh, pillars of different categories of metrics, like time-related, cost-related, and quality-related metrics, we may have some hybrid issues. What I mean is we may combine the time-related issues with some other uh, metrics, or the number of uh, test cases with the number of requirements. We may merge lots of different metrics to decide our, uh, about our efficiency or about our maturity, like not only measuring the number of test cases, but maybe uh, measuring the number of test cases per requirement. Or maybe not only measuring the test execution duration, but maybe measure the test execution duration per uh, test suite. So we may uh, merge different metrics, and in this way, we can generate some hybrid metrics, not only one aspect, but regarding lots of different aspects, something per some other uh, metric regarding another aspect of the product. In this way, uh, we may have some clues and we get some insights about our efficiency, how efficient we are uh, performing our activities and uh, what percentages we have. In this way, uh, we can get uh, this uh, valuable information. And finally, uh, in addition to all these, besides all these technical aspects, we have another aspect, which is the emotional metrics, which is mostly related to the satisfaction of uh, our employees, our teammates. Because we are always talking about uh, the aspects of the product and always uh, talking about the technical aspects of the project management. But how about the people? Because the satisfaction of the people or how delighted they are to be in this project, to be part of uh, this project, it is really essential. How proud they are to be a part of this project. We uh, should have some core values and we should continuously track the satisfaction of all our teammates. Because this is the culture of our uh, organization. Otherwise, uh, projects can be somehow uh, fulfilled or uh, the product can be somehow developed. But if we are not managing the satisfaction of the people well, then after some time, they will uh, start to look something different, look something uh, new. They will start to leave our projects and products, uh, product development activities. So uh, even though we are somehow developing our product, it is very important to continuously track these metrics for the long-term success. Because not only the short-term success, but if we aim a long-term success, then the satisfaction of people, the emotional metrics are very essential as well, not only the technical ones. But uh, after considering all these, both the technical aspects and the emotional aspects, all the metrics, maybe sometimes we have to be careful about some of them. Because some of the metrics may be hazardous, which means they may be misleading. Like only concentrating on the story points, it may be misleading. Or only concentrated on the bug numbers created by uh, different people. Like if we evaluating the performance of each uh, individual by the number of bugs created by those people, then it may be misleading. Because all bugs are not uh, in the same criticality level or everyone is not concentrating on the same uh, module. So some people are concentrating on more uh, developing the automated uh, automation code, or some other people may be concentrating on only the execution of the test cases. So maybe if we try to make a performance evaluation, only considering the number of bugs found by the people, it's, it may be misleading. So speaking in general, if we are trying to track something strictly related to some specific numbers, it may be a hazardous matrix. Please be careful about not strictly uh, concentrating only on some specific numbers or specific metrics. 
we should be really careful about uh, considering uh, the whole situation. We should be observing the uh, big picture, not only a specific uh, metric. And finally, at the end of my uh, presentation, I will share a practical application uh, in which uh, we will see how we can perform this uh, continuous monitoring activities because continuously performing these activities manually is not easy. So what we can do is to develop some uh, automated code, uh, automation scripts, and then uh, continuously or periodically uh, run this over some jobs or some uh, maybe uh, CI platforms. So uh, what I, I will demonstrate in this uh, part is, uh, first of all, I developed a code which uh, pulls all the information that I need from JIRA, the uh, issue treatment system that I use in my project. So I was uh, performing some requests. I was pulling some queries. And then getting after getting the response, I was parsing the response and while was uh, reaching to the relevant information that I need. For example, when was an issue created or when the issue was closed? So after getting these two, I was calculating the duration between the creation time and the resolution time. So in this way, I was uh, measuring the duration for the resolution time because I already know the creation time. I already know the resolution time. So I can calculate the resolution duration. So uh, after collecting all this information, eventually I was making some categories like the performance regarding tasks or the functional regarding uh, related tasks, the uh, functionality related tasks. And then for each category, the average resolution duration I was calculating. And if some specific issues were resolved in a, a very unexpected time, like much uh, faster than the average duration or much slower than the average duration, then I was investigating what was the root cause for that. Because normally there was a supposed uh, estimated average duration, but it was out of the range. So I was trying to understand what was wrong, what went wrong to resolve that specific issue. And after collecting all these uh, numbers and all this information, of course, I have to store it somewhere. So trying to keep them locally is not easy. So what I was doing is to upload them into our uh, cloud uh, platforms. In my case, I was using uh, Amazon Cloud Watch Services and uh, calling those services, I was uploading my data and it was continuously stored over there. And finally, I collect all the numbers. I store them continuously. So this is great. Numbers are perfect. They are telling a lot of uh, information to me. They are representing a lot of story. This is perfect. But having only numbers is still not easy to interpret. OK, lots of numbers, numbers, but so what? We have to interpret it. We have to analyze it. So to do it in an easier way is to uh, transform them into some uh, charts or graphs. In this way, we can easily see if the numbers are going high or they are reducing in time. And if we have some limits, we can set some boundaries or threshold values. And if they are violated, then we can immediately see if the limits are violated or not. So having graphs or charts uh, makes life much more easier for us to understand what the numbers are saying. So we can use lots of different dashboards and monitoring tools like Grafana to do these kind of graphs. And eventually, we can immediately see what's going on in our environments. If the trend is going high or low in time, we can immediately see. So to wrap up. What we have discussed throughout the whole talk is we went over some uh, different metrics to track to decide about the maturity of our quality activities. And we uh, discussed the importance of these monitoring activities, what kind of advantages we can get from them, and then what we can do to perform these monitoring activities in the best way. First of all, we may optimize the subset of the metric, and then we can customize the environment that we are using, and then we can categorize them. We can uh, track some different categories of metrics like time related, cost related, or quality related metrics. And then we can hybridize them, right? Instead of uh, concentrating only on one aspect of the metrics, maybe we can combine them, merge them, and generate some hybrid metrics. And last but not least, of course, we have to interpret them. Okay, we are collecting some information, we are getting some numbers, we are collecting all this data, but eventually, what this data says, this we have to understand. We have to analyze and we have to interpret and take the needed action items because otherwise doing the monitoring activities does not make a lot of sense. We will have only some numbers, but eventually these numbers should serve, should contribute in the improvement of the quality. So if we do not interpret what they are saying to us, then maybe uh, it will not be a lot of advantage 
that we will get from them. So this was the summary of what uh, we have discussed in the session. So I hope you have get uh, some insights and wish you to enjoy the rest of the great talks uh, in this uh, great conference. Thank you so much for listening and do not hesitate to reach out to me or feel free to get connected over these uh, contact channels. Thank you so much.